Drive 60 kilometers north of Ontario's capital city and you'll find the town of Innisfil. In terms of area, it's roughly the size of Mississauga, but with less than 1 20th of the population. Late last year, a new GO station in the town got its funding and with it, an opportunity to build something innovative and to redefine what Innisfil will look like. Here to outline the new Orbit project, we welcome Lynn Dolan, she's the mayor of Innisfil, and Jason Rayner, the town's chief administrative officer. Nice to have you back here at TVO. Thanks for having us. Let us just, for those who don't know, uh, show everybody where Innisfil is. And uh, we should just do a little etymological history here. The name Innisfil comes from the Irish, Innis Fyle, an ancient mythological name for Ireland. I did not know that. But anyway, that's where Innis Innisfil is, just south of Barrie, uh, about an, an hour, if you're lucky, with traffic uh, north of here. And we want to take a look, and I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, to start bringing up a series of pictures to describe the artist's renderings of what you guys have got planned over the next decade or so. And why don't you just take us through this? Why don't we get a start? Mayor Dolan, just get us started. What are we looking at here? Certainly. You're looking at a concept or a vision uh, that we've been working on uh, for our mobility orbit that we've uh, dubbed the orbit. Uh, we want to create a future-ready community, cutting edge uh, with the density and uh, an urban uh, walkability with, that creates health and wellness, uh, sustainable development right in the heart of our community, surrounded by a GO train station. And what's there right now in all of that space? Not, not a lot. Uh, just some farm fields, uh, which gives us this chance, Steve, to, to start with a blank slate. Uh, which I think is uh, a unique opportunity that not a lot of municipalities get when they're trying to sort of reimagine what their community will look like 50 years, 100 years down the road. And the architecture firm you're partnering with on this is Partisan, is that the name of it? It is, it's Partisan. We okay. went out with an RFP for an architect and we created through uh, both a strategic plan of our council and also residents, we created outcomes that we wanted throughout this project and things that we wanted included. And we were very excited to partner with Partisan and, uh, and work on some of the concepts that they've come up with. Now, now, Sheldon, if you would, just go to a wide shot here. Okay, that you can see behind us here, it's called orbit because of the concentric circles that create a kind of, you know, orbit, if you like, planets orbiting the sun, if you like. When I saw the presentation to council that was made, one of the words that came up to describe it was whimsical. Now, whimsical is not a word that one often hears described uh, in the planning process of new urban space. What's whimsical about this in your view? So whimsical in the, in, in the sense that uh, we're, we're still very much in the concept stages and that we want to look at things very differently uh, and have the opportunity to embed in this exactly what we, what we want it to be. We want the density, but we don't want the big brick walls. We don't want uh, like the shadows in the backyard. We want lots of, of public space that, so there's lots of, of social friction in those spaces and we want the the terracing effect so that everybody doesn't feel penned in, that there's still lots of green space in the area. It was really important to our residents that we have, uh, we keep Innisfil the way Innisfil is now, but at the same time absorb the growth in, uh, in, the, in this part of the community where they'll have the opportunity to walk to a GO train station, and at the same time then allow other parts of Innisfil to retain that rural feeling and also have local food and local uh, agriculture. Well, let me pick up on that with you, Jason, because of course, in one of the videos that I saw, a lot of people moved to Innisfil because they want to get away from development. Mm -hmm. And now you are talking about pretty significant development in a place that up until now has been, you know, I, I don't think it's suburb, and it's exurban, I guess. Is that the best way to describe it? Whatever. In any event, how concerned are you that by inviting all this development, you're going to lose what people actually move there for in the first place? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think the focus there is around the size. So as much as it looks quite large, it's uh, only 800 meters from the GO train station. Uh, so that's, that's, not a, that's not a lot of distance. You know, you can walk it in 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes. Uh, and so it's a lot of development in a concentrated spot. Uh, and our hope is that if you're looking for your uh, backyard and your single family dwelling home, you know, 
I don't know if we have white picket fences, but you know that concept, we have that too. But we wanna offer the alternative that says, I don't wanna have to shovel my driveway. I want the benefits of urban living where I can grab my uh, uh, espresso and walk to work um, in a community that right now you know, has 80 kilometer uh, an hour roads and, and not a lot of sidewalks and a lot of ditches, right? So how do we offer that alternative, uh, but at the same time preserve the, the traditional Innisfil life too? And what about farmland? How much farmland gets lost as a result of this? Yeah, so I think we did a study, and I can't remember the exact number, Steve, but um, in order to, to provide the development we're talking about in the orbit, it would be hundreds of acres of, of farmland that would have to be lost, uh, if not thousands of acres, you know, as you start to spread out you know, single-family dwelling instead of condo developments. Um, and so we can do all of that in 800 meters and actually put most of our growth in that area over the next probably 30 years uh, within that 800 meters. Okay, I hear this described as well as a smart city plan. What's smart about it? So the smart city concept is the fact that you're starting with a blank canvas. So we're uh, inviting innovative technology. We're hoping to work with not-for-profits. We're hoping to work with academia to come and help us create and embed the technology that's required right from the get-go, as opposed to trying to retrofit something that's already there. Um, the concepts that we're looking for, some of them we don't know exist yet. We don't know what we don't know, mm -hmm. but we're inviting people who know more than us to come and help us build this city of the future. Now, you've heard a lot of the controversy, obviously, as it relates to sidewalk labs in Toronto, as they're trying to basically drop, in some respects, a new city in the middle of, or I guess at the, at the waterfront of, the existing city. Any of those issues come up in Innisfil? So far, not. You know, we haven't. We've gone through a very focused group right now that we're working with. But definitely, the concept now that we've launched the vision is to uh, go deeper into uh, public engagement, um, both from inside the municipality and other stakeholders that want to work with us. And we want to hear that kind of feedback and and what they want to to see coming. The alternative, I guess, I've had some people who don't you know, aren't keen on the kind of Jetson look of it. I think I've dated myself by using that term. But we've never had anybody who is, uh, who so far spoke against the idea of the concept. You know, if you call it the orbit, people are gonna make comparisons to the Jetsons, as you just did. For those who don't remember, or who are too young, that was a cartoon many, many moons ago where people drove through space, anyway. They aren't going to be flying cars as part of this, too, are there? <laughs> Not, yet. Not, yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But maybe. But <laughs> Not maybe. yet. Okay. Maybe some drones. Yeah. <laughs> um, timeline on this. When do you expect this is all going to be done? Yeah, so the, the focus now uh, is on the station. So we want the GO train station up and running. So that design is beginning in earnest now. Our hope is the station is up and running by 2022, the end of 2022. And uh, concurrently with that, we'll probably see some initial residential, multi-use, uh, you know, retail, that kind of thing starting up as well. Um, our hope is to attract businesses into kind of incubation space as well. Um, so within the first few years, you'll see uh, literally the orbit start to come, come out of the ground. Uh, and Within 10 years, it'll be a full-fledged community, hmm. uh, for sure. Now, you can't plunk something this big and this ambitious in the middle of nowhere without, I imagine, just uh, significant costs to put in hydro lines, uh, to, to put in roads, to, I mean, I'm sure the property developers are going to put up the buildings, but the city's going to be on, the town, excuse me, is going to be on the hook, I presume, for all of the services that go along with it. How are you going to afford all that? So to answer that question, I just have to step back a bit. So we uh, have been advocating for a GO train station for many, many years. And we were successful under the former government with Minister Del Duca at the time to be one of a bundle of GO train stations that were going to be built. And we were very excited about that until we found out that we were part of a bundle. And when we said, no, we really wanted to customize our design and we're, nope, this is it. This is what you're getting. Uh, but the good thing was that the province was paying for it. Um, with the new government, uh, a, a new direction was that they were no longer paying for GO train stations, so which, uh, which took us aback as a challenge a, as a bit for what's, a bit. What's the cost on the GO train station? So the cost on the GO train station, this one will be 20-ish million dollars. And the idea along the lines of the, uh, the developer who is getting the air rights or the increased density, so more profitability, uh, to foot the cost of the actual GO train station. So the town will not pay for it? 
The town is not main, paying for the GO train station. Cortelucci is paying for it. We, well, the, the landowner group, which is mostly owned by the Cortel group, and we have other developers in there too. And and we've worked really hard with the Cortel group. They've been a great partner, as, as have the other developers, on building a vision that everybody is jumping on board with. But it's really important that we will also get development charge credits for things that, you know, are what you're talking about before, like uh, like roads and, and, and what we now build for. And the concept of building a, a more concentrated development is way less expensive than the sprawl that we're building now. Sure. Intensified development, yeah, it's cheaper in that respect. It's 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 yeah. cheaper to build and yeah. it's cheaper to maintain into the future. <laughs> well, let me pick up on that because, of course, uh, cities and towns all over the place, Jason, are trying to figure out, you know, we need space for cars, we need space for pedestrians, we need space for bicycles. We need now. There's going to be new whatever those things are. What do you call mm -hmm. those things again? E scooters. E, -scooters, e -scooters, right? right? That that uh, we're in the middle of a five-year pilot program on now. You are starting from scratch and have to figure out how everybody's going to share the the space. Mm -hmm. Have you figured all that out yet? No, but what, what we have done, and if you look at the images, you'll, you'll see a real uh, concerted effort not to have a lot of parking spaces. Uh, you know, uh, the one comment I've received on the, on the station is, you know, it looks like a beautiful station, but where's the, you know, the mall size parking lot that you expect at a GO train station? And, and of course, that's the vision for, that, that I think everybody has, that we're going to move away from, uh, you know, the reliance that we have on cars, particularly in urban centers, uh, and, and be able to free up that space for green space, uh, for, for cycling, for active transportation. And, you know, the beauty of designing a community around 800 meters is you really, it really is walkable. Uh, uh, and you really can get around whether it's an e-scooter or, or a bike, uh, and that's the idea. So we've purposely done that. You know, time will tell. I think a number of people probably expected in 2020 that you know we might be in flying cars by now. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly when that's going to happen. So there'll be a phased approach to this. But the idea of starting with the future uh, vision is that we can future-proof the infrastructure. So we don't have to go back and retrofit everything every 10 years because all of a sudden the technology has shifted. But does it make sense, Mayor Dolan, to take a pedestrian first approach, which as you've just pointed out, that's the idea. You want people to be able to walk all over the place. Does it make sense to take a pedestrian first approach when probably everybody who lives, well, not everybody, but almost everybody who lives in Innisfil has got a car, right? That's how you get around now. You got a car. They have two cars and a boat and a snowmobile there you as go. well. Mm -hmm. but or the, they use Uber Transit. They do mm -hmm. also use we'll get Uber to that. Transit. Yeah. <laughs> so the, but the idea of being able to start with a blank slate, so I, I, I know that any um, municipal politician could agree with me that trying to retrofit an old street, like we have some of them old cottage roads in Innisfil that had no sidewalks and open ditches, and now people are demanding pedestrian spaces and, and trying to acquire land and, and go through all that business to, to do that. Having the ability to start from scratch where we know that we can keep the road allowances to the size we need and we can plan for these things and, and to plan it in a space where we aren't infringing on other people. Uh, if I build, if, if the town has an application for eight infill houses that back onto a dozen houses, that council chamber is full the night of the public meeting, everybody complaining about those eight houses. If I build 500 houses where it doesn't impact other people, nobody shows up to the public meeting. Hmm. So it's much easier to build it when it's not in anyone's backyard than it is to try to fit it in a space that's already uh, occupied. Your population right now is about 35,000? We're, we're getting on to 40, if close you count 40? Friday Harbor. So we're close to 40,000. And when this is done, where do you see it going? 150,000. Huge increase, right? It is a huge increase, but if you think of 50 years ago, you think of where Markham was 50 years ago, or Vaughan 50 years ago, or Mississauga 50 years ago, and how much farmland they had. Mm -hmm. You know, we're at a point now we can react to development as it's happening to us because we know it's going to happen to us, or we can plan for it and plan it in a way that we want it uh, and in a way that our residents that are there now want it to happen. But you are basically taking the city of Barrie and plunking it down right on top of Innisfil. That's that's the plan, right? Over Within the, 800 meters, over the, the coast transition, yeah. Over the ensuing years, mm -hmm. I mean, this is not going to be without friction, difficulty, sure. protests, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. You guys all ready for that? No, 
but we will be. <laughs> it's, it beats the alternative. For Which us, is, it's yeah. the best of two worlds. That, that it's homogenous development, that it's single family dwelling, that eats up a whole bunch of space, and the next time we turn around, there is no more farmland, there is no rural Innisfil. So, and it also gives us different product. Right now, when people move to Innisfil, the only thing they have, a choice, is for a townhouse, or a single family dwelling. If you get to the point in your life you'd rather just have a condo and lock the keys and go to Florida all winter, you've gotta move out of Innisfil. If you get to the point where you maybe look at something like you're a young professional, live in Toronto, um, you could live in the orbit and have a small space, a more affordable space, live in the city and still have a 10 minute walk to the lake and lots of green space. Okay, that's the personal pitch. I want to hear from you the business pitch because mm. right now when people want to set up businesses, they're looking at Markham, they're looking at Vaughan, they're looking at Richmond Hill, there are some other communities that are uh, sort of, you know, in the neighborhood but closer to Toronto. Mm -hmm. Why would they come to your place? Yeah, I think two reasons, Steve. One is uh, we're, we've created an incubator for uh, entrepreneurs to actually be supported. So you can get a mentor, you can get connected into the ecosystem with a network of people, get access to capital. And of course, big cities like Toronto and, and other places have those incubators, but you're competing against literally tens of thousands of people who are interested in doing the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, if, you, if you're opening up your tech shop in Innisfil, you, you're probably the only person who's doing that specific niche product uh, or service. So there's a real opportunity to grow the business in an environment that gives you a lifestyle that, you know, is really second to none in, in Ontario mm. from our perspective. Um, and that we're, we're learning that more and more people who are wanting to make that leap into starting their own business, um, they, they want to do that, but they want to do it in an environment that they can also raise their kids in uh, and then mm. enter, enter, enter Innisfil. Gotcha. I want to make sure I understand this properly. Most cities and towns, when a developer comes and says, I want to put this building here, you tell them, here's the maximum you're allowed to build. Mm -hmm. Are you guys saying, here's the minimum you have to build? Is it different? In the orbit, yes. Hmm. And, and you know, all of our policies uh, will be developed around that. We've already had in our, in our official plan we have now, we have higher density around, around the uh, original GO train station. But what we want to create is, is definitely an, an a buy-in from the vision from the developer in the first place. And we want them to create uh, or agree to us that this is what we want to see in the future. And I have to say to staff, they've been really good at uh, in our organization about um, being able to, uh, I want to say, flex and pivot on ideas. Uh, you know, we're a fairly flat organization, so uh, when we do something different, we don't have to go through layers and layers and layers of bureaucracy, and and we can work and tweak out the program. So if the development comes and we come to a hitch in it, I'm sure we can uh, through our organization uh, switch it and and make it so that everybody's in agreement with the new uh, format. And I just want to make sure I understand because you're going to be telling developers you must build at least this much. There are minimums. What's the thinking behind sort of a completely opposite approach to most places? It's a good question. And, and actually, even more nuanced, Steve, what we're thinking is something called di about dynamic zoning. So the idea is that, you know, typically the, the, the height uh, and the density is set every five years through the official planning process uh, for most municipalities in Ontario. What we're actually suggesting is that the policy bakes in a dynamic shift as the community starts to develop. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, your, your plot uh, of land may have a maximum height of, of eight stories and, and a minimum height of four in a particular area, but your neighbor builds 12. So your dyna the dynamic zoning would shift your rights as of right automatically to 12 stories and a minimum of eight, something like that. Mm -hmm. So the policy hasn't been worked out and we're inviting actually partners on the academic side and on the profit side, uh, private side, to work with us to develop this because as far as we know, there's nothing like this in Ontario. But the concept seems to be attractive if you're trying to create a community that's future-proofing itself so that you're not doing what other municipalities are doing now, which is saying, how do we reinvent ourselves or create a downtown in an area that there was no downtown before? Or you know, how do we actually start to preserve the small piece of farmland that's left in, you know, name your GTA uh, municipality, mm -hmm. won't pick on anybody, but. <laughs> you're the town right now, right? It's the town of Innisfil. Are you expecting when this is all done, you're gonna be the city of Innisfil? I never really thought about that before. And it really doesn't matter what we call ourselves, except that we continue to innovate and create spaces that people uh, want to live in.
We want to create our own destiny. We want Innisfil in 50 years, 100 years, to look the way that we decided it was going to look, not the way uh, the OMB or the LPAT decided it was going to look. Gotcha. In our last few minutes here, I do want to remind people that the last time you were here, we were here to talk about the fact that you wanted to create a kind of a, you know, a different public transit system because you weren't going to buy a whole bunch of buses and, and you know, you weren't going to build a subway. But you're making a deal with Uber. And I guess I, I want to know how that's going. It's going tremendously well. We, uh, we've been about two and a half years now. Uh, we've done some tweaks, and, and again, that's one of the, the benefits of this. The latest thing we did was a tr what we call the fair transit plan, so that people who, are, who need it most, people on low income, can come in and register, and uh, when they call their uh, municipal transit, they'll get it for half price, and they also get a free trip to the um, food bank twice a month. Hmm. So uh, we have had other tweaks. We've had to actually make people make people wait another three minutes when they call. So instead of six minutes, they wait nine minutes. But that allows us to pool more. So we end up with more full, uh, full cars than we had before. And we're serving the entire population of Innisfil. Uh, we had to put, do one fare hike. Uh, we are still polling about 70% satisfaction rate from our users. And for the price of uh, the cost of servicing with a traditional bus, uh, a quarter of the municipality, we're serving the entire municipality 24 hours a day, seven days a week, door to door. And you didn't have to buy any buses? And we didn't or streetcars or subways? None of that. Gotcha. How long is the contract for? Uh, so it, it was a three year initial pilot. So it's almost uh, over. And we've, we're coming to the end of that. Yeah. What are you going to do? Well, we'll probably have to RFP again, just so that uh, we provide, you know, the opportunity for different players in the market uh, to, to participate. But Uber's been such a good partner in trying to customize and tweak the system to make it work in a small town like ours, uh, that uh, they'll have a pretty good application, I suspect. So you anticipate re-upping? I would imagine. I think so. We're, we're looking at the data and, and trying to analyze if there are high capacity routes, higher capacity routes that would make a lot of sense. Uh, so for, for example, getting to the GO train station that's currently in Barrie, but one day will be soon in Innisfil. Uh, does that make sense to have a higher capacity, small, smaller bus or that kind of thing? Um, but right now, it's, you know, the, the convenience is so high for people uh, that, uh, you know, the, then the popularity is so great uh, and the ability for people to get around at any time, as the mayor says, you know, just it, it's hard to even contemplate going back to a half or, you know, two or three people on a big bus driving around. You do know that if you're a town or a city of 150,000 people, you're probably going to have to buy a bus at that point. <laughs> we, 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 would, we would have to look at that for sure. And we've done so many other really innovative things. We've partnered. We're the first municipality in Canada to accept cryptocurrency for property taxes. We partnered Is with... Is that right? What do you we take? We do. We do. Bitcoin. Bitcoin. You do. And we've had people oh. move to the municipality just for that reason. And this is part of the reason we think we'll be able to attract more high tech uh, in the innovation and use it as the uh, igniter for our uh, orbit. And we partnered with Rover as well to uh, solve some issues we have around uh, parking in our lakeshore. So we're we're we've got a great staff and we're working hard and councils very much on board with looking to other ways we can make life better for our residents. We will continue to watch this whimsical project with uh, fascination and interest and we want to thank both the mayor of Innisfil, Lynn Dolan, and Jason Rayner, the chief administrative officer of the still, to this date, town of Innisfil, but you never know, <laughs> for coming down to our headquarters here at Young and Eglinton in the middle of the center of the universe. Thanks a lot, you two. Our pleasure. Thanks, Thank Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.